Hi, and welcome to the Rare Business Podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm a consultant, advisor, researcher, and writer on all things related to customer service and customer experience. Through this podcast, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, and leading thinkers about what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees in this fast-moving modern age that we live in. If this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then welcome. And please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com, as I've now completed over 250 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then thank you for returning, and I'll aim to do a good enough job to keep you coming back week after week. Anyway, that's enough from me right now. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today, I have Andy McMillan, who is CEO of User Testing. Hi, Andy. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Now, Andy, uh, for people that are not familiar with user testing, can you, and, and also for our kind of listeners and readers just generally, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? Give us a bit of a background sketch on Mr. McMillan. Sure. Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned in the opening, I'm the CEO of user testing. I've been here for a little more than a year. Uh Uh, Joined the company after stints mostly in the software as a service space. So I was at Acton Software in the marketing space for a few years. And before that, I was an executive at Salesforce and at Oracle. So spent most of my career in the enterprise software space, Uh, kind of grew up as a technical uh, person and then a product manager uh, is kind of primarily my background. Super. Now, the, I know that we had a uh, conversation oh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were just comparing notes about different things, but it was primarily the thing that instigated that, that, that conversation and also this interview was that you guys have recently published a new report called The Rise of the Experience Economy, the 2019 CX Industry Report. Now, I always like it when people produce research because it actually gives us something to properly talk about, you know, data and feedback and you know perspectives from from different sort of people so can you tell me a little bit about the report you know why you did it i mean is this one in a series of them and just generally kind of give some background to kind of where, where the reports come from sure i mean one of our primary audiences for our product are researchers uh, okay. ux researchers customer experience researchers so we have a natural kind of affinity to the to the research world uh, right. so i very much share your sentiment about the the value and people doing this kind of research. And we actually do a variety of different reports. We do industry reports. So we'll look at things like the experience of the airline industry or something like that. Right. Uh, And then once a year, we do a much broader kind of CX industry report. And what we're really looking at in these reports are what are the trends we're seeing uh, in the customer experience space? We try to really tear that apart and look at the perspective of what customers are talking about, but also what companies uh, large consultancies, you know, what's really happening in and around the world of people who are trying to deliver amazing customer experiences. Okay. And can you, I mean, can you tell us what the, what the, the big headlines were? I mean, obviously we don't, you don't want, I want to take, I don't I want, I wouldn't want to ask you to give me the sort of A to Z of the report, but give us a clue what the big, the big headline, headlines were. The big one this year that we found really coming through was, people really starting to talk about the experience overall more than the technology itself or even just the digital aspect of the technology. So we heard a lot from people who seem to feel like they've got a lot of technology in their lives. And what they're really looking for, I think ultimately is for the technology to work for them to solve a problem. So it wasn't really technology for technology's sake or digital transformation, if you will, for the, you know, for the thesis of doing digital. It was more, how do we think about the way in which either we as a brand or we consu- you know, engage with the brand as a consumer, how does that experience really work? How does it work for us? And how does technology help that experience become you know, more efficient or more meaningful as opposed to just kind of being cool and digital, if that makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. So but when you said that, I was, it, made me, and it made me sort of sit up and go, huh. So does that mean that, or by implication, what you found, does that mean that even though we're, we're in this, I feel like almost this fog or this maelstrom of this dust cloud of customer experience activity, as it were, that actually, um, and people say, well, we're, doing, we're trying to be customer centric and focus on the customer and so on and so forth. But actually, what you're finding when people are talking about the experience overall, that are they inadvertently admitting that actually in the last 
few years prior to this that they've actually most that many organizations have got lost in the digital and lost in the tech and haven't really been solely focusing on the experience. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think we feel that as consumers. I mean, yes. I think all of us use apps in our daily lives where it works. I mean, it's not like the technology is falling over or you're getting, you know, could not connect to the app kind of problems. Mm. But it doesn't feel like it really works for us. It doesn't feel like they really know us or they're really thinking about how we want the tech to work. And I think part of that is that we've become extremely data centric in how we think about building these experiences. You know, we are kind of in the era of big data and automating the experience with big data. And sometimes that can feel pretty impersonal. People don't feel like the app or the brand that they're working with, maybe more importantly than the app, really knows them or is building an engaging experience. A lot of us like the brands that we interact with, right? We're not really just trying to you know, go through the shopping cart experience as fast as possible. We might want, you know, to, to browse around and buy something else. We also don't want to feel like the app is just cramming stuff in front of us for us to make. So I think sometimes this sense of kind of business efficiency and using big data to solve all of the problems can kind of make us all feel like we're just kind of turning the crank of the widget when we're sure. using the app rather than engaging with a brand. And I think that is really short-sighted. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I mean, because it always, it always, um, you know, I always think the language is a really interesting indicator of where we're at in terms of mindset and things. And some people dismiss it, but I think it's actually really, really important, the, the language that we use and how we describe things. And it seems, still seems quite anathema to me when people talk about being, you know, customer centric, and then they talk about wallet share. Right, exactly. You look at it just go, exactly. hang on, you've just reduced me down to the size of my purse. And, That's right. And it's just like, what? <laughs> um, and it, yeah, so, it's, so it's, it's surprising. But it, the, um, so this, you've got this, this emergence of, we're almost coming out of the, the technology and the digital sort of thing, and people are actually going, actually, we need to have a knitted together experience overall. I mean, and that's, that's a good thing. I mean, were, were there any sort of sub- headlines in there that actually particularly surprised you, the things that you, that you found out? Well, one of the things I really enjoy in the survey that I, I always find surprising nuggets in is we go out and ask consumers what they think are, is important, and then we ask companies what they think is important in the next five years. Right. And that's always an interesting kind of mismatch, right? What are, what are companies focused on versus what are consumers focused on today? And I don't think it's inherently bad that that's a mismatch, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the ones, for example, that came through in the study this year was, you know, consumers are really looking for more and more and better touch interfaces, right? So think everything from tablets to kiosks and things like that. Right. Um, companies are very focused on voice right now. And uh-huh. I think that makes sense. Like as a technologist, we all get that. Like, oh, okay, I get where we're going with, you know, the, the personal assistance in the home and, and all those kinds of things. But it, I think it's important for us to stay grounded that the consumer maybe isn't quite there yet as a mass market uh, use case. So um, how we balance that is as brands and as technology companies, I think it's less about being right and more about being thoughtful. Like, can we be thoughtful about how to introduce new forward-leaning ways of doing things, which might be voice, but keep in mind that your average consumer today is really just looking for a better experience on a touch device. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's almost a bit like um, the organizations almost get out of touch because they're, they're so concerned about keeping up or keeping ahead of or keeping abreast of technology um, that they lose the, and that leads them rather than actually being led by their, their, their customers. And it's almost, but you, I know you have to be future focused as well, but they're just not getting, a lot, many of them don't seem to be getting the, the balance right. Because we've seen the same thing happen with, people's experience with chatbots, you know. That's right. That's exactly right. People piled into them and everybody's like going, well, this is great. No, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, it, and it doesn't mean it's an inherently bad idea or bad tech. It's just about how do you blend that in over time? How do you bring customers along with you? How do you mm-hmm. listen to those customers along the way sure. to think about the fact that most customers do say they want better technology from the brands they work with? I mm-hmm. think we're, we all like the idea of these, you know, voice activated assistants, for example, yeah. right? 
So how do we bring that into the process while at the same time realizing right now, I might just try to be trying to do something in my checking account and I just want to push three buttons and make it happen. And if the sure. voice assistant can help me later on, that's great. But you know, right now I'm just trying to solve a problem. So I thought that was interesting. And then the other one, if you, know, if you let me call out one more here, the other yeah, one I thought course. was really interesting was there was a, a lot of the report about this idea of, of digital transformation success. And okay. I found that particularly fascinating because you know, I've been in the technology industry for about 20 years. And one of the things I talk a lot about now is um, it's amazing how much incredible technology is available to anyone to build an app on top of now. We have these amazing public cloud providers that will scale your infrastructure and handle the traffic. And you know, yeah. we have these great payment system backends and things like that. So, you know, the technology problems we had 10 years ago when we were rolling out a big transformation project was often that the tech wouldn't work, you know, that the tech team would fail or it wouldn't scale or, yes. you know, we all know the stories of people that would run a Super Bowl ad and then their, you know, all their servers would crash and none mm -hmm. of the traffic would get to their site, right? We don't have as much of that problem anymore. Um, so what really struck me was, I don't think it's that people aren't able to stand up to technology. I think it's that people are having a hard time standing up engaging technology. They're having a hard time building, you know, a, a website or a mobile app or, a, or an omni-channel experience that the consumers engage with and get that same kind of brand value out of that they would from the traditional business process. And so I thought that was very illuminating as well and, and maybe, you know, an opportunity for people to be, to kind of take a step back and think about how they're thoughtful about the application of technology. And that's really what came through for me as opposed to, you know, I think everybody who went through business school a decade ago all sat through some class and learned about how technology projects fail. Yeah. And that wasn't really what the report focused on. It was more the engagement with the tech failing. And I think that's really a different set of challenges than we've dealt with in the past as people who are building you know, applications and digital experiences. And, and what do you think of the thing is that, what's behind that, that sort of lack of engagement? Is it, is there a, is there an organizational and behavioral sort of thing that's behind that, that we need to sort of one, recognize and two, get over, or is there something else going on? Well, this is something we're really trying to dig into, and uh, I don't know that anyone has all the answers yet. I, I will say one of the thesis that we're operating on here is that we think more and more companies are no longer actually engaging with the people that they're doing business with. You know, we right. think of ourselves as being so connected to our customers now. We say things like, oh, our customers are with us every day. They carry our bank around in their pocket, or they carry our retail site around in their pocket on their phone, and they mm -hmm. can buy from us at any point in time. But I think what we sometimes lack is the, maybe the empathy that comes from knowing the customer, right? They're, they're, they're in some ways disintermediated by technology, right? It used to be someone walked into the retail bank twice a month to deposit their check and you saw them and you talked to them and then your bank manager might tell you what's going on with the products that you're offering and what people are really telling you. So right. even though people are still coming in and depositing the money, maybe they don't like something about the way you've changed the checking account structure, right? And, later, and it's an early indicator, but later on, you know, you would see those, those customers leave. We and don't have those customers coming into the bank anymore. So I think there's a gap in how we actually get to know our customers. And so here's the, th here's the th interesting thing is that because you talked about this idea about data-driven data -driven decision-making. Because in the, actually in the report, also you said, you talk about these identifying trends and in the report is quoted as saying the report quotes as saying is customers are the most important trend to watch i mean do you mean by that actually we need we need to grow our appreciation that our customers are not just their data i think that's exactly it and i think it's that customers behaviors um, might change more slowly then their engagement with the brand, how they feel, right? If you, I was using the example of a, of a bank earlier, you can think of an airline, anyone, right? If, if that experience degrades over time, if it's more and more frustrating to deal with you as a brand because I don't interact with anyone, and more importantly, the brand doesn't recognize that because they're not interacting with me either, mm. right? I still have flights booked that over time I might transition to another you know, airline, but I don't see that right away. Okay. So I think that's part of the challenge. We had a really interesting uh, customer case recently where the customer told us they used big data to do a whole bunch of work to shorten 
their checkout experience. Right. And they felt like this was a huge win. They got some additional conversion. You know, this is one of those like, oh, it's up 1.5%. You know, everybody cheers. Mm-hmm. And I get it. Like, that's the world e-commerce managers live in. Um, but they're a subscription service that people were buying, right? It's one of these new products where a box of something comes to your house every okay. month. And what they found was their subscription churn skyrocketed. And when they went back and they, they you know, we partnered with them to help them figure this out with, with our product. What they found was they were building brand loyalty in their longer checkout process. People felt like they were getting a box of goods that was designed for them uh, when they had that longer experience, right? So the data actually kind of led them astray. Now, you could make the argument maybe over time they could have, you know, hired more analysts and you know, looked at more data and maybe they would have figured out, you know, hey, back here and six months ago we made this change. Or they probably could have just talked to some customers along the way, right? They could have seen what that experience was like through their customers' eyes and thought, wow, we're building brand value here. So how do we, you know, improve the checkout conversion, but without losing this brand engagement? But surely there's also this other thing, which is that um, beware of some of the, some of the things that are, the, that are winning the, the, you know, the, the present popularity contests. Like, for example, you know, the idea of, are we going to make this friction-free? Are we going to make this as easy and quick as possible? And then you, you potentially get into and in principle that might be a good idea for some businesses but for others may actually not work at all as in the case that you just mentioned and you end up to or potentially throwing the baby out with the bathwater. that's right the the best brands in the world are not the ones that just churn through their customer touch points the quickest right yeah. they are companies that think about the value they're providing They treat their customers in an empathetic and valued way. Customers Mm -hmm. feel that. They feel like this brand knows me. They understand the problem I have. They take the time to care about me. And they deliver a great experience that solves my problem. And I Mm -hmm. think sometimes that's a little bit tough to put up on a bar chart in a meeting where nobody in the room actually talks to customers, doesn't know what the customer actually is dealing with. And instead, we're all just trying to crank another percent and a half out out of the chart. And sure. I think that's when companies start to do things that feel like good decisions and might help the balance sheet in the short term, but really start to cost you customer loyalty and customer engagement over time. So, you know, you talk about this, uh, you talk about empathy and we're going to bridge that, that gap. I mean, so I know that's, that's kind of what you guys are in the business of and helping kind of uh, businesses do that. But I mean, and what sort of things do, should we be do you think custom companies should be doing in order to bridge that, that empty gap? Because it's not just a thing and not just a checkbox thing. It has to be almost a change in mindset or a development of new habits in many ways. Um, yeah, I think companies need to make a deliberate effort to have people involved in building and marketing product actually see and hear and feel what their customers experience from the perspective of their customer. Mm. So whether they're using a technology platform like ours to do that or not, It's something that we're passionate about. So I'll give you another example. I was working with a large uh, mobile phone carrier here in the United States. Uh And one of the things they conveyed to us was how much value they got from our platform because the group of people that build their pricing plans Mm -hmm. are a very different demographic than their target audience for buying a four-line family plan. A four-line family plan is very often bought by a young family, very often bought by the mother in that family, yeah. their pricing team is by and large guys in their mid fifties. Yes. Right? So that is, you know, however, however good they are at their job, I would argue vigorously that it would help those folks make better pricing plans and better shopping experiences for those plans. If every so often they listened or watched or observed someone in their target audience using their site, shopping for a plan and making decisions for their family. They will be better at their job if they have that perspective. And that's really what we're trying to advocate that people do. Take yeah. the time to watch people. Don't, not, not you guide them, not you telling them what they should believe, but sit and watch someone use your product. Watch sure. someone who's not you, right? We all come from a perspective, a background, a set of experiences. Um, you know, think of who your customer segments are and watch them use your product. Yeah. It's amazing how powerful it is. You can also do big data. We're not saying don't use analytics or don't, you know, don't do those things. That's fine. That's great. But blend that with that real engagement. And I think that is where you can start to build real empathy. It's also very um, motivating. 
right? I, I had another story where we had a, a, a customer tell us, you know, they're putting up all these charts saying that they were struggling in one demographic. It was actually uh, kind of senior citizens that they were mm-hmm. struggling with. And because it wasn't a very large portion of their customer base, everybody had just kind of let this start to slide. Mm. And so it wasn't until they put up a video where they were actually watching someone struggle through using their application that everybody in the team were like, we got to fix that, right? That's not the right answer. That's not the brand experience we want. And so, again, I think empathy is not only understanding the problem, but it's it's a feeling you have of wanting to have people have a positive experience right yeah. um and that's that's sometimes tough to get from a chart well absolutely it feels to me that the um the data will take you so far but it's almost like the um being willing to put in the uh, you know almost the emotional effort to um to get that insight that'll take you to the next level as well to make it re- to help you really build understanding to add real value onto the on the top of all, all of your data is kind of that's the that can be the difference um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's as simple as if you don't want your customers to feel like you treat them like a number, stop treating them like they're just a number. I mean, it's, it's not, a, not a very challenging concept, but, but I think hard to do at scale. I mean, that's what companies tell us. Look, we, you know, we like the idea of, we're doing this, how do we do it at scale, right? How do we have, you know, a thousand developers we have start to understand the experience of our customer if we sell through a distribution channel that they're not part of, right? How well, do you bring the voice of that customer to the process? I, well, I think that's kind of fair, and the, and the scale question is is a fair one too. Um, but it's almost a bit like I think is if you. It seems to me that if you if you want to take twentieth century almost like production line and organizational economic sort of thinking, and and um, and apply it to this type of dynamic where empathy and experience is is is, is of supreme importance, then. This, the answer to the scale question isn't necessarily what you, may not necessarily be the the um, the one that you're looking for, if you know what I mean. Well, I think yeah, I think that's right. But it's also thinking about you know how do you also use technology to solve part of that problem, right? Uh, sure. One of the amazing things about companies now is a small group of people in you know in Silicon Valley and you know Detroit and London wherever can build an app that can touch the world, right? Yeah. But the inverse then becomes, well, then how does that small group of people in one location in the world start to understand the perspectives of people around the world that they're impacting? And so yeah. they almost need to think about how do they also use technology you know, in reverse, right? How do you use technology to get connected with those folks? Because you are building an experience for people that are different than you are, right? That, yeah. that number, and also just beyond kind of demographic differences or geographic differences, they also, you know, people who build your product suffer from what researchers call the curse of knowledge. They are yeah. almost by default expert users of your product. Mm. And the next person who downloads your product uh, or, you know, goes to your website or whatever that might be, they're a first time user. And yes. the longer you have your product in market and the more complicated it gets, the harder and harder it is for your team to relate to that. So you have to bring that less experienced user into your process or you will build a bad application. I mean, that, that is one of the big challenges of, of having a successful product is this kind of curse of knowledge that develops on your team. No, absolutely. I mean, the, um, it reminds me of a story. So I remember talking to the chief product officer of a company called Zopa here in the UK. They are the largest peer to peer lender in, um, in the UK. So regulated financial service organization. Um, but they're purely digital, and they had that sort of problem. They they were developing things sort of at arm's length, relying on sort of data to see what's what happened, but weren't necessarily seeing the results that they wanted. So what they ended up doing is they ended up um, bringing in some of their customers to do some real transactions, um, and have well bring them in their customers into the office and actually have them do some real transactions in front of them, but actually in a on a computer and then. They were observed behind this kind of one-way mirror. They had everybody from product, from marketing, and from development, um, and design, and so on and so forth, watching. And uh, Andrew, the chief product officer, was there. He told, he told me the story about this, and he said the, the 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 look on some people's faces when you they had to watch somebody interact with something that they designed or built or coded or whatever. 
and for it not to be as easy as they thought it was. It was a bit like kind of drawing your nails down a chalkboard. It was excruciatingly painful, but actually they made it so real because it just blew up all their assumptions and they got to see something in real life in terms of this is how people actually interact with something that, the, that you built. And it just made their whole design and insight process so much better. Well, and it, 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 I love that story because it's motivating too, right? People yeah. who spend their lives building these apps want to build a great experience, right? Yeah. They're just, again, they're disintermediated from the, the real feedback and that kind of experience that gets them motivated. I mean, most folks that are in the, you know, software development, application development kind of space, they're, they're kind of craftsmen. Like they want to build something great that, yes. that people like. And so yeah. if you can bring that customer into the process in a very real way, um, I have found there to be nothing more motivating to a team than that. And, mm-hmm. uh, and it works. And so I think it's really a question of how do we think about, you know, how do we think about doing that? And how do we think about doing a better job of making sure that that customer is part of the process? Perfect. So let me go back um, a little bit into back into the report um, because I wanted to, there was a couple of things that stood out for me that I wanted to ask you about. Julia, um, sure. one of the sections is called, um, or one of the headli- little sub headlines is called digital, it says digital transition, digital transformations rather, aren't just digital. Can you, t- can you explain to me what you meant by that? What did, what did you find that find out that sort of made you choose that? That, that subheading, as it were. Yeah, it was interesting. I think we found two things that kind of played into that, into that heading. Mm-hmm. And one is, um, you know, we think about digital being kind of that last mile to the customer, you know, the app on their phone or the website they go to or whatever that might be. Um, but the reality is a lot of the rest of the company has to be prepared for that experience to make sense. Right. So, you know, for example, we work with one of the, you know, large uh, coffee chains in the world, right? Well, you know, they rolled out uh, an app to mobile order coffee and they partnered with us closely to do that. And one of the things that was challenging in that process was the rest of their systems had to be prepared to work with that, right? Yeah. So think of yes. how do you decide in what order these things get made and, and where do they go and, you know, how do you organize the customers coming in and, and all those kinds of things, including the, the, you know, imagine like the inventory in the store, how is that represented in, in the app, right? Yes. If you were going to go in and how do you know what to have? So, so there's a lot of things that are part of that experience. You can think of a variety of different industries where, you know, the digital experience matters, but it's a, you know, it's often a, uh, a backend process that has to support that buying a car, you know, taking a trip on an airline, like it, it can't just be the app, right? Yes. Um, so that's part of it. It's kind of a technology systems part of it. The other part was acknowledging that from the customer standpoint, I don't really care about any of your systems challenges. Mm. What I want is a smooth experience. Um, and we sometimes talk about omni-channel. That was a thing that kind of reemerged back in the report this year. But I often think omni-channel is thought of as being multiple digital channels. And I think we're really saying it's, it's the entire experience. It's, you know, how I shop online, but also what it looks like when the package is dropped off and how it's open. And, you know, if, if the package is stolen from my porch, how do I feel about that? Right? It's mm. not really a good experience that. How do I want to handle that as a company? If that mm. coffee, you know, isn't there and correctly labeled when I arrive, like what's that like? So it's really this kind of two-sided piece of how do we as a company think about our entire uh, kind of customer value chain and how digital plays a role in that? And then the second being, um, you know, how do we think about the customer's perspective when we do that? So that, you know, that's a seamless experience. Okay. I think the coffee one is a particularly interesting one because for a long time, I used to talk about picking up a coffee as being one of these things that would always be kind of a non-digital experience. You know, it always seemed like, oh, you know, I, I still have to get the coffee, right? And yes. it's not a very expensive um, asset. It's hot. So, you know, the idea that it's going to be somehow delivered to me efficiently seems pretty far-fetched, at least in the near term. So I have to go get it. And yet, you know, uh, we have two coffee shops right in my neighborhood. One's owned by a local guy who's wonderful, a great guy, really nice coffee shop, plays really cool blues music. Uh-huh. The other one's this large chain with a mobile app. And I go to the, you know, I go to the large chain every time because I have my two-year-old in the morning. We go pick up a coffee for me and one for my wife that I drop off before I go to work. And right. the mobile ordering is fantastic, but it has to work. You know, it has to be this great experience. And it's, it's now a digital experience for me getting coffee. And that's something I just wouldn't have imagined. And so I think businesses have to be 
really thinking about all the ways that their customer can get value from, uh, you know, bringing digital into the process, but acknowledging that it's, it, it will then still be bigger than just digital. Perfect. So now, I, I, Andy, I know you work with a whole bunch of different companies to help them sort of, well, one, build that empathy gap, understand the customers, you know, trial things, kind of like see how things going to work, you know, like finesse things and things. I mean, what do, from, from your experience, what are the ones, what do the best companies do? You know, how do they set themselves up? And kind of what do they do to, that, that, that sets themselves apart, as it were? Because I think that's the, yeah. it's, it's almost, like, you know, I, 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 think I, I do think there's probably a lot of companies that feel like they're a bit like scrabbling about in the dark and that, uh, right now, because it's like they're trying and trying and trying, but they're not necessarily getting it right. So, right. Well, I, yeah, I, I think there's there's a couple pieces of it, and and no kind of magic bullet, unfortunately, for folks. Um, one that we're obviously passionate about, yeah, exactly. <laughs> one we're passionate about, which is, um, you know, we enable companies to see and hear and listen to their customers use their products. So I think that's at the base core. That that was why I was excited to come join this company. I think that's what makes you know an experience great. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty hard to build a great experience if you don't have empathy for your end user. I, yeah. I argue it's almost impossible. So I think that's one. But around that, I think you also have to create, and this is more of a management answer, I guess. I think you do have to have people that you know, can, can build that empathy, but then have creative ideas about how to uniquely solve that problem. Right. And so you know, having an environment where people can, can you know, think freely, create interesting ideas, um, prototype those, test those again with real customers. You know, mm -hmm. is this interesting? Is this something that really solves that problem? I think is really important. Um, and I do think it's also being able to understand kind of the analytics and how to really scale the business. So again, mm -hmm. we, I think we often end up talking about the problem with only watching data, but we're also very quick at user testing to point out that we love data. Like I think it's great that people use big data and predictive and AI and all this great stuff to build these amazing experiences. You know, I'm a geek at heart. I think those are really cool things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm not saying throw that stuff out. I'm saying in addition to having a great ability to do those things, having an empathy for the, the customer and then having the creativity to go out and really think about what the service is you're delivering mm. and how do you create unique value and how do you create brand engagement through that creativity, I think is really important. There are a lot of great companies out there that have really just focused on their back office efficiency and how they make more margin. Mm -hmm. And those companies are starting to go by the wayside because someone is building a more creative and more engaging customer experience than them and they're losing customers. And so, you know, I do think it comes down very often to the people you have in your company, having sure. people that are smart and creative and get your, and understand your customer really amazing things can happen. Um, and if you don't have that, I think you need to really take a step back and look at your team and say, can I bring in more empathy and can I bring in more creativity? Because if you can bring those two things into the mix, uh, I think you could do some pretty amazing things. And so if I was to ask you to boil it down even further, Andy, because you know how people like instructions, right? Yeah. So like, Just go do that. Um, what, would you, yeah. what would you say to them? So like if there was, because most of the people that, that listen to this, are interested sure. in their own the, the service and the experience that they offer. And if you were to say, the takeaway from what you're understanding from the rapport, what we've talked about today, you go like, if you, can, if you were to do one thing differently, here's what I would suggest to you that you all start doing. What would it be? What would it be? I, I would think about the exposure time that your team has to your customer directly. Okay. So think about, cool. okay, I've got you know, 25 engineers, on my team, how many exposure hours does each of them have a quarter to a real customer? Yeah. And if the answer to that is zero, I would have a lot of concerns. And if it's higher than zero, but not very high, I'd start to think about how do I scale that? Because I would challenge anyone that if that team sees and feels the pain of your customer, um, you will get great things out of that team. And if they don't, you will get who knows out of that team. And, and so what do you mean by kind of the, the sort of exposure? I mean, is that kind of like volunteering in, the, in, the, in a help desk or support desk or kind of getting on the phone to people or listening into calls or visiting them on site or is it all of the above? I think it could be any of those things. And this is where, you know, I kind of separate from just preaching our product to kind of preaching what I think people should, should really be focused on. What they should be focused on are these exposure hours. 
What we do is allow people to record those experiences. We have a large panel of testers that will review your product, speak their thoughts, and what you get back is a video of someone in your target audience kind of going through a set of, of steps you've asked them to do. We have some customers that will actually run watch parties. You know, it's kind of like a Netflix and chill, but for, for developers, right? They'll get together and buy some pizza and, and five developers will watch, you know, two or three of these videos of somebody right. going through and talking about their product, kind of like the experience you talked about with your friend, Andrew, right? So they're, yeah. you're behind the glass, right? You're not interacting with this customer, which is actually really important. You're not just coaching them on what to do. You're watching someone you know, kind of in the wild, if you will, sure. use your product. So that's what I mean by you can really scale this. You know, I had someone, a uh, product manager one time tell me, you know, I just don't know if I have a lot of time to watch, you know, if I run a test on user testing and I create five videos and they're 10 minutes long each, you know, do I really have time to watch 50 minutes of video? And my challenge to them was, I bet if every night of the week before you went home, you spent 10 minutes and watched one of those videos, by the end of those five days, you would be a much, much better product manager, arguably more so than how you spent 50 minutes any other way during the week. Sure. And, and that's my challenge to organizations is, is, you know, find the way to scale that exposure time, yes. but you will get it back tenfold. And so, you know, to your question, I don't care if that's people sitting in the call center talking to customers, if that's a meaningful way to get the feedback from folks. Um, if it's, you know, hiring a, an agency to come in and run a big usability study for you and you're willing to kind of pay for that and go through that process, or if it's using technology like ours, mm -hmm. uh, we have some that even just do a voice of customer program. We have one large customer that makes, um, an e-reader device and they rolled out a program where every executive on that program once a month has a 30 minute, what we call a live conversation, essentially a video interview with a customer somewhere in the world and they just ask them, what are you reading? And how did you decide to, you know, do you, you use your e-reader versus buying a paperback and, yeah. and all these kinds of things, but it gets them out of the mindset of, you know, their location and they're a tech person and, and that kind of thing and talk to a real person. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, exposure hours is, is the term I've heard used most often. And, and it's something you can measure. You can think about how many exposure hours have people on my team had and how do I get them more exposure to our customers? You know what? I, I, I like that. I mean, um, I've heard something similar before, but I've never really heard the term exposure hours, but it's, it's, it's very straightforward. It's, for, it's to the point. And it's something you can, well, you can be very clear about it. It's like, what is your level of exposure to your customers over the course of a week or a month or whatever? And, you know, the answers might be quite stark. I think they usually are. I mean, that's yeah. one of the things that really often our customers are taken aback. Like, well, how are we supposed to get, you know, our development team in front of customers? And that's when we start talking to them about using technology to try to do that. But, you know, often the answer is zero. Yeah. You know, like, oh, yeah, we have a, you know, we all oh, have an offshore dev team and they talk to a product manager. It's like, yeah, that's not, that's not good enough. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's not the answer. Right. Uh, people need to to have that empathy if they're building something. And, and we all know it. I mean, we've all used apps where you're like, boy, who designed this? And what do they think I really wanted? And the, and the answer is, they don't know. That's yes. why it's not a good experience. I, there are very few people that set up to build a bad app or a bad experience. Yes. Um, and so, you know, what happens when, when we end up with those bad experiences? It's very often that they don't understand what their end user is trying to do. Perfect. I really love that idea, Andy. So thank you for that. Um, so. Is there, I mean, I know you're a busy guy and, and it feels like a really kind of nice place to sort of to end this is almost this idea is like kind of what's your level of, of almost like, oh, what's the level of exposure hours or how many exposure hours have you had with your customer over the last say month as like a, just like a starting question. Yeah. So I think, is there anything else that you'd like to add on top of that? Cause that just feels like quite a kind of like slap you in the face, going to go on, there's your homework. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I agree. And I, I really enjoyed the conversation. You know, I think, uh, again, you hopefully it's obvious we're passionate about this. And again, whether you're using our platform to do it or not, I just, I want people to have great brand experiences. And I think we're just trying to help people think about how to do that. Um, and what I like about the exposure hour concept is that it, it assumes what we call positive intent, right? That people want to build a great experience. And well, yes. if you make that assumption, then, then how do we how do we empower people to make that great experience? And that's what I find so exciting about kind of this point in time. Like I said, it's not like most companies are failing because the tech falls over. Mm. They're failing because the tech doesn't connect. Yes. And so, you know, if we can play a role in helping people, you know, connect with their customer with that technology, 
Um, you know, I look forward to a day when the apps on my phone or my tablet or my personal assistant are even more engaging and we could play a little role in that. I think that will be a success. Awesome. Andy, that's been great. I mean, I really like the one, some of the things that you're finding out, obviously, but I just really like that. It's almost like a challenge. It's like, how many exposure hours have you had with your customer over the last month? That's great. I mean, I think Absolutely. Um, I, I love that. And so just want to say thank you for that, for sharing your experience and the report and your insight with us today. I'll make sure I get all that linked up and edited up and give yourselves your good selves across at user testing a big, a big shout out. I mean, if people want to find out more, I guess it's user testing.com. That's correct. Very well. So, but once again, Jeff, thank you for your time today. That's been great. Thank you for having me on. It was a lot of fun. Well, that's it for another interview. I really hope you enjoyed it. Now, every time I complete one of these interviews, I learn something new. And I try and incorporate that new learning into my writing, my speaking, my workshops, and the consulting that I do for my clients. If you're interested, you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswimsco.com. But one final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or whichever podcast platform you choose to use and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening and do listen in again. All the very best.